Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about the new discovery of a very interesting creator in Australia known as the Yarababa creator that seems to have been created right around the time when the Earth went from being a frozen snowball, the period known as the Snowball Earth, to the liquid wonderland that we know today. In other words, this was the period when it's very likely the asteroid actually thawed or melted the entire planet. Let's talk a little bit more about this and welcome to What The Math. Now it's actually kind of shocking how many different collisions our planet received, but it only becomes apparent when you really look at our neighbor, the moon. Every collision on the moon, after it happens, it stays there, because there is no plate tectonics, there is no actual geological activity, so everything that happened in the last few billion years is visible to us. Earth, on the other hand, does have geological activity, so only a few craters remain here, and only some very large craters survive to this day. Now, the largest crater to date, and actually the previous record holder for the oldest crater discovered, is located in South Africa right here, and I'm actually going to make a separate video about this crater uh, in near future. But the so-called Vredefort crater that you see right here, um, this is a picture taken from space, was created around 2 billion years ago um, from a collision with a rock that was about 10 to maybe 15 kilometers in size. And that's almost double the size of a rock from Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula, that was responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs. So in other words, these rocks and all of these craters that were created on our planet are actually created by relatively similar in size objects. Some slightly larger than others, but for the most part, none of them are like in hundreds of kilometers in size. They're usually anywhere from one kilometer to maybe about 10. But the real surprise came from this region right here in Western Australia, the uh, area known as Yarababa. And it doesn't really even look like a typical crater, to be honest, but it is there nevertheless. And the scientists knew about it for a very long time. The thing is, they never really bothered to measure how old this place really is. But some scientists were really curious, and specifically the scientists behind this paper in Nature that decided to investigate what's really happening here. And to everyone's surprise, they've discovered a really, really large object underneath all of these layers of rock. And this um, crater that was created by a collision is roughly around 70 kilometers in diameter, suggesting that the actual piece of rock that collided with our planet was very likely just a little bit smaller than the asteroid that collided with our planet when the dinosaurs perished. So in other words, it could have been about 3 to 4 kilometers in size. But honestly, this shouldn't really surprise us, because Australia in general is a great place to look for historical events. The entire area here is literally like a preservation site. Many things here, when they happen, remain untouched and completely undisturbed for millions and even billions of years. So in that sense, we're definitely going to be discovering even more interesting things in this region. But how exactly did the scientists find out how old this area is? Well, today, for the most part, when it comes to trying to figure out how old certain rocks are, we use a very interesting technique known as uranium-lead dating. The way that it works in principle is, let's just say I found a meteorite somewhere in Australia. I want to find out how old this is. I take a small sample of this rock and I measure how much of uranium-235 compared to lead there is in this sample. And the reason why I'm measuring uranium and lead is because all of the uranium-235 will eventually slowly transform into its final component which is lead-207. Approximately half of all uranium will convert into lead in about 4.5 billion years. So if I discover something that has an equal amount of uranium and lead in it, it's very likely about 4.5 billion years old. If I find that there's a little bit more uranium, it means it's a little bit younger. If there's more lead, it's a little bit older. But the thing is, when there is a certain event, like for example, a very energetic asteroid impact, it's going to generate so much energy underneath it that all of the uranium will actually get reset. So now the geological clock has restarted and you can kind of start counting from zero again. And so if we find a sample and we measure its uranium to lead content, we'll be able to identify how old certain material is. And in case of Yarababa area, the samples were about 2.3 billion years old, 2.229 more specifically. And surprisingly, this date is somewhat meaningful to us, at least in terms of historical events that happened to our planet. 
It just so happens that around 2.4 billion years ago, our Earth experienced a major transformation. A few years ago, I even made a video about this, uh, describing exactly how our Earth looked back then. It was very likely purple. And you can find out why in the video, right there somewhere above my head. But in a nutshell, a new type of bacteria started to appear on Earth and became extremely successful, and that bacteria was able to produce a lot of oxygen. We refer to this event as the Great Oxygenation Event, when basically the entire planet started to become covered in oxygen. Before this, it didn't actually have that much. And this oxygenation event very likely killed off most of the other bacteria on the planet because oxygen is actually somewhat toxic especially in large quantities. So in that sense, this event transformed our planet and first it removed the older life, but then it also turned the planet much, much cooler, simply because there was just not as much greenhouse effect anymore. And eventually the entire planet froze over. Although it's quite possible that certain parts of the planet were still kind of um, more or less open and there was a little bit of liquid water showing in certain parts. But the vast majority of the planet was very likely covered in ice. And one of the reasons we know that this happened is because when we look at really, really ancient Earth by looking at various sedimental deposits of our planet, we actually discovered that there were certain periods when even in the tropics, there was actually quite a lot of ice. And more specifically, we see these signs of different glaciers moving around and disturbing the ground underneath. The only explanation to having ice in the tropics is if the entire planet was basically frozen. There's really no other simple explanation here. And furthermore, we actually think that this happened twice. First time about 2.4 to 2.1 billion years ago, and second time right before the very complex multicellular life exploded on our planet. The period we refer to as the Cambrian Explosion. And I've also talked about this concept in one of the previous videos in a little bit more detail. And so if our planet was an ice bowl at least twice in history, something must have happened to the planet in order to turn this into this something must have melted all of the ice, or at least started the melting process. Now, we always suspected volcanoes, but there's really no way for us to prove that this was a volcano. But we also know that if an asteroid hits the planet, that essentially all froze over, um, there is a chance that it can pierce through the actual ice shelf and release so much of various materials, and more specifically, water vapor, that's a very, very strong greenhouse gas, that can cover the whole planet and dramatically increase temperatures pretty much overnight. Well, at least in a few years. And this could definitely kickstart a new sort of melting, a new thawing of the planet and restart the planetary cycle. But why talk about it when we can actually demonstrate it? So here comes an asteroid that will hopefully help us simulate all of this using Universe Sandbox. So once it collides with our planet, it should open up at least a part of it melting some of the material here. We'll probably have to wait a little bit for this to happen, but eventually you'll see that there is um, an area here that becomes exposed. This could be the initial area where the melting occurs. At the same time, this collision itself, because of all of the greenhouse gases that were released, is going to start melting ice all over the planet, and you're going to see this any second now. As our whole planet starts transforming relatively slowly, but within about a year, it's going to become basically like the Earth we know today. So all of this may have, or very likely have, started as a result of this collision. And the fact that the date of this collision remarkably seems to actually correspond to the end of the glaciation period, or the end of the so-called snowball Earth, is quite unlikely to be just a coincidence. So there might be a relation between these two events. Now, of course, because this is science, we'll need to confirm and reconfirm this, and a lot of other uh, signs need to be discovered before we can confirm that this is exactly what happened. But this first study is an amazing first step in trying to help us understand how Earth went from being a completely frozen over world with life only surviving underneath the ice caps into the beautiful world that we know today. And this is also something that we need to understand if one of these collisions one day happen around objects like Europa or Enceladus that are essentially ice worlds just like our planet once was. And so once we understand how these massive collisions affect our planet and how they affect other planets and other moons, we'll be able to understand how all of this helped our planet evolve and most importantly how the life became so complex and if it can happen somewhere else. But until we discover more, that's really it. 
Check out the paper in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe support this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot. I'll see you tomorrow, come back tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.